Hello, this is Andy Gis, and this is my second video on Friday, July the 23rd. I have changed uh, the way I've done my video. The first one, which you absolutely don't want to miss, is a deep dive in what's happening with the unvaccinated that have exploded in the US and all the, ch all the things we have learned about the protection that the virus are giving you with the Delta variant that unfortunately is spreading. Lots of great information there, which unfortunately seems to be showing we may need a third booster for the people at the age of 65 years old. So do not want to miss that one. Uh, on this video, I'm going to combine the clinical and the case update. So there's some good news and bad news. Uh, the Delta is driving a surge in the US and the Europe uh, with a lot of hot spots in the US. They're all tied to the lower vaccination counties. Good news, India and South America had massive drop. Uh, and uh, we have a lot of update on vaccine and therapeutics. So let's get going. So on a worldwide basis, unfortunately, driven by Europe and the US, we are back up for another wave. Uh, and we, in the last two weeks, the world has changed by up to 25% uh, in both mortality and the number of cases there. Uh, unfortunately, the US is the driver with 34 million cases. And you can see that if I break it down there, uh, you can see the good news, Latin America is dropping and so is Asia. But the two going straight up here is uh, Europe, and the US, red is, is the US and Europe is the light blue there. So let's kind of understand what's going on. So United States went up 180%, UK went up 65%, still driven by the Delta variant. Indonesia, we'll talk a little bit about that, is having a big surge. These are the big drivers in the number of cases. India is clearly going down. Uh, so India, you can see this is a massive drop. They had that extreme surge. But look at the numbers, the data just came out that 67% of the population has developed antibody. It's, it's Delta variants basically spread across the population there. Uh, and that's based on a sample of 29,000 people there. But look at people between 45 to 60 years old, 77% develop antibodies. This Delta, when it took off, it just went like a rocket. And we really don't want to see this in the US. So, so interesting lessons there. Uh, and then one of the reasons is that only 13% of Indians are fully vaccinated. And they believe that the excess deaths uh, could be as high as 4.7 million people there. Official report was 400,000, but it's very clear that a lot of the people did not report it. And some of the uh, analysis they have done, so it's underestimated by a factor of 10 to 20 X. Uh, so lots of data showing that mortality rate during that big peak there was unfortunately massive. Uh, maybe 4 million people died. So Indonesia is unfortunately having a Delta surge. And this is a picture of one week to the second week. It's a one week difference there uh, of an area near Jakarta there where they, they, they're having this massive grave. And look at that explosion. Same thing that happened in India. It's, when this Delta goes, it's just like a rocket ship. Uh, so we really want to stop it here. We're just in the inflection point in the US there. We don't want to go all the way up. So South America, great news. Uh, everybody's down, uh, Chile, Brazil, uh, Argentina, and South America as a continent there is going straight down. They had a, they had a very different, um, uh, you know, uh, they had a different mutation. They have this Lambda variant, which is two times more infection. It's different alteration of the spike protein that we had not seen before. But, uh, and it was like up to 90% of the infection of Peru. The good news, we'll see this a little bit later on, is that Chile has done an amazing job vaccinating their population there. And that's why it stopped and the herd immunity does work. This is what we need to do in the US. We need to basically block the virus to go from body to body there. And so I'll show you some of the data there, but it's very clear that the drive to, to the vaccination there is clearly linked to the drop by 80% of the case rate there. So UK just officially announced what's called Freedom Day on July the 19th. They lifted all the COVID restrictions, despite the fact that they're having that big surge. Look at that surge. Um, uh, and of course, it's very politically charged because people believe it could be a major gamble. Now, the data is intriguing there. So the third way they're having there is having a lower mortality rate. And that's because they did a great job vaccinating the elderly there. So a lot of the people are getting infected there, but you know they don't have the same mortality rate that we had with the wave that they had uh, last, last winter there. So great data we can learn from them. Uh, we have had 3.7 billion doses given in the world. That means around 27% of the world population has at least one dose. We're doing 31 million doses per day. And of course, Asia is driving a lot of these numbers. South 
Africa is totally ignored and Africa has you know, less than 1% vaccination there. So we need to keep an eye on them being a hotspot. Community vaccination, you can see the UK has now passed Israel. Uh, so they've done a great job at vaccinating the population there. That's why you don't see, you see infection, but you don't see the mortality. And that's because they have such a high vaccination rate. Europe is going straight up and you can see the US is slowing down. And we talked quite a bit about that in the first video. Uh, so Chile, uh, you can see that has vaccinated over roughly over 70% of the population there. And that's where they were able to get close to herd immunity and see that massive drop. Unfortunately, the US, which used to be one of the leading one in vaccination has now dropped uh, to you know around 50%, 49% are fully vaccinated. And, and so that's not good. We really need to continue to, to expand. So what's happening there? These are the area there where we have an increase in, in case rate in the last eight weeks. In big red is when you see a, a, a case that has increased over 26% in the last eight weeks. And these are the one we talked about. Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, and Florida are clearly on that vertical curve, which hopefully are not gonna be what we saw uh, in, in the UK and in Indonesia there, but this is kind of worrisome there. And then you see other states were kicking in. And then when you look at the confirmed cases per 100,000, you can see this really big hotspot and you're gonna see it's totally linked to the lower vaccination rate. And this is the positivity rate. So yellow is bad. That means over 25% of people get tested uh, positive there. And you can really see these hot spots in this area there was very, very, very contagious area. And that's tied to the vaccination rate. Lighter green means lower vaccination. That's where we see the hot spots. So it's clearly not break of the unvaccinated. Are you ever concerned? Uh, Missouri, Arkansas, Louisiana, Florida, uh, that whole Southeast is lightening up again. And unfortunately, as I said, it's linked uh, to the vaccination. The hospitalization rate are starting to crank up. Some of the same states I talk about there. And you know, there's a four to six week delay. So I would expect uh, next month when I do the update, this is gonna go back up again even more. And, and this is being driven by the younger population. And the good news, we're doing a good job in protecting the 65 years old, but you can see the growth is people between 18 to 59 years old. This is what's kind of driving the, the, the hospitalization. And remember, I'm talking hospitalization, i.e. severe cases. So in California, uh, California is a tale of two cities. Uh, we basically have a bit of an uptick here. And that's because a positive rate has gone from 1.4% uh, a month ago when I saw you to 5.2%. So we, unfortunately, we're having a, a, an uptick in the positivity rate, and especially in the Los Angeles area. And so let's do now an update on the clinical side. This is a picture of COVID. Uh, unfortunately, the little green dot there is COVID that's taking over a cell. So long COVID, new data has emerged. Uh, just for people who haven't heard about long COVID before, you have a 10 to 30% chance of getting long COVID, which is a combination of a lot of symptoms. And we'll talk more about that. And unfortunately, it takes 6, 12 months, and maybe years to fully recover. So uh, it's also called post-acute sequela with PACSC, but long COVID is what you will hear in the press. Uh, three papers just came out. Uh, a Lancet uh, showed there's over 200 symptoms, and uh, they had 3,700 participants. 91% of these participants took over 35 weeks to recover, and they're still in treatment. Uh, a lot of this is post-exertional malaise, and that means that you try to exercise, and I'll talk more about that, and you really have massive setback when you do that, chronic fatigue and brain fog. Another paper came out of the Journal of the Royal Society of Medicine, and it shows that you have a high long COVID risk if when you get the infection, you had at least five symptoms in the first week when you get infected. So if you are getting a lot of symptoms that you really want to be proactive so you avoid the risk of developing long COVID. And another paper showed that 26% of adult uh, COVID patients that did not recover within six to eight months after diagnosis. And remember, most of these patients, we only have six to eight months of data. So these numbers will probably go up. And same thing I talked about, depression, breathlessness, and chronic fatigue are the classic symptoms. The post exertional malaise is the same key definition for people who develop, who develop chronic fatigue, also called ME. And what you can see is that you exercise. So if you tell people, oh, just go exercise, you'll feel better. That's the worst advice you can give them. You can really set them back and make them significantly sicker. And what happens is that you do this physical ex exertion there and you literally crash. It's the only way I can explain it. And when you crash, it takes days 
if not weeks to recover, not hours. And the severity is pretty high, i.e. these people can barely do anything. They, they end up being bedridden there. So you, if somebody has long COVID, who's at risk of long COVID, you have to get them to professionals who know how to do a very progressive rehabilitation uh, to get these patients there to fix the neurological disorders and damages. There is some hope. Uh, there's uh, interesting data from Cambridge University showing that they may be able to find a blood test that shows that the cytokine, which is the cytokine storm that happened at the time of the infection, is staying in people who develop long COVID, i.e. the immune system is not shutting off properly and is continuously creating this inflammation. So that would be great because right now we don't have a way to diagnose long COVID. So to be seen, they had a pilot study of 85 patients and just started a, a longer, a bigger sample with 500 patients. The UK Office of National Statistics has just come up with a report that around a million people in the UK or 40% of people who have been infected are still suffering a year later. So that's a massive number there. And again, same thing I mentioned, fatigue, shortness of breath, muscle ache, and brain fog. The other thing that's coming out is people who have been infected with COVID are developing lasting heart rate changes. And they found this out by using Fitbit and the Apple Watch. And they see that compared to other viral infection there, your heart rate is changing and it's lasting longer that you see in normal uh, viral infection there. And they start developing what's called the autonomic dysfunction there called POTS, P-O-T-S, where you no longer control your heart rate and your blood pressure. And one of the classic symptoms is that you're sitting and you get up and suddenly your heart rate goes straight sky high from 60 to 200 and your blood pressure crashes there. And so this to give you some of the data there. These are the people who get infected there. You can see they turn positive and they have a massive change in their resting heart rate. And then it drops when they're in the recovery period. And then it takes them a long time. This is like three to four months before they start going back to normal there. And you can see there's a big deviation up to five beats per minute, a higher le level uh, for people who have, who have had the acute infection. Uh, on the booster side, uh, we talked about this in the first video, Pfizer has asked for FDA clearance for a booster uh, to be given after six months after the second dose. Um, and yes, the CDC and the FDA have gone back to Pfizer to say, show us to us why we need it, uh, which hopefully after the first video and the data from Israel, I think it's pretty clear because we do need it, but we may have a delay there in getting these products approved for people who start needing it, which is gonna be in the next few months. J, J has had a new neuro risk that has emerged. It's called Guillain-Barré syndrome, which is a French word. And this is a very rare neurological disorder in which the immune system attacks the nerves and cause a potential uh, paralysis that's at least short term in certain cases could be long term. Now, to give you an idea of the magnitude, the average risk in the population is one per million. And they just increased it to three to five cases per million. So i.e., it is a really, 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 really low risk. Um, the other warning they got is a rare blood clotting, uh, which is happening for one between 18 to 48 years old. So we have a lot of black warning in Europe where they do not give j, &J to the, to the women in that age group. Uh, we have had 12.7 million people vaccinated in the US with the j, &J one, one shot. Now it is a different uh, vaccine. It's using a common cold virus called the adenovirus. And there's a perception is it is that adenovirus that is creating the side effects, which mRNA does not have. And interestingly enough, AstraZeneca, which is using a similar approach of a common cold virus, a slightly different adenovirus, is having the same problem with Guillain-Barré. So there's clearly something going on with that uh, adenovirus. Um, there's, if you remember, we talked about this last time, but uh, the mRNA have a very small incidence of 12 cases per million uh, of people uh, developing a myocardial uh, infection there, which is all treatable. You just have to be aware that if you take uh, the second dose and are typically five days after the second dose, you will know if you have heart palpitation, just get yourself checked. Um, it's very, very rare risk. Uh, and you can see it's, a, it's, a, uh, it, it's, not, it's not a big issue, but it is a higher risk. Uh, for the young men, uh, uh, you know, especially between 12 to 30 years old, that you will have for the GNJ. So again, very low risk, but I just want you to be aware if there's any symptoms that you need to take proactive uh, action. 
Sinovac vaccine uh, just came out with some data there in Chile. Uh, it shows that it's 66% effective against the virus compared to Pfizer at 96%. But this is the interesting part. The vaccine was one dose probably took more risk and they end up with a high infection rate than the unvaccinated. And of course, as you would expect, the vaccine was two dose have the lowest infection rate there. So that just came out in a New England Journal of Medicine. And so uh, Sinovac is using an inactivated COVID virus. So they do use the COVID, but they take away part of the virus that's, uh, that's contagious there. And it's used in both uh, Chinese vaccines, Sinopharm and Sinovac. Again, I want to reemphasize the mRNA from both Pfizer and Moderna do not rely on these methods and so they don't have those issues. So uh, in the lessons of the weird, uh, in where I grew up in Belgium, uh, a 90 year old managed to get two infections from two different variants from two different people. And so she both got the alpha and the beta variants. And unfortunately she died within five days. So that would be a hard one for the immune system to fight. And there's a perception that that occurrence of having two variants infection is probably happening, but we're not doing enough genetic testing to really be aware of it. So I just wanted to give you the heads up on that. Uh, Novavax just reported some data and uh, the vaccine is not approved in the US yet. Uh, they had their data on 15,000 patients. They half with the vaccine, half with the placebo. They show very high efficacy for a white patient at 94%. But you can see that efficacy, which is only 86% for the alpha variant, uh, you know, is dropping to 51% for the beta, uh, the beta variant, which is the South African, which we know is the really hard one there. So. Um, and so Novavax, you can see, you know, uh, is starting to develop its effectiveness, uh, you know, roughly three weeks uh, after the second dose, you can really see the big split there versus the placebo group. Uh, on the world basis there, the World Health Organization has finally decided we should probably focus on therapeutics because the virus is here to stay. And so there's a big program there to repurpose drugs. And so they're looking at anticoagulant IL-6 receptor, which is clearly something we see in the hospital setting there is being uh, basically activated by the virus. So in an agonist, it's trying to stop the IL-6 receptors there. And, and also some uh, antivirals and monoclonal antibody. We know the monoclonal antibody are not working with the Delta uh, variants there, they're able to avoid it. So uh, ivermectin is something that is getting more and more traction that it may be helpful. And there's been 60 trials ongoing right now with over close to 19,000 patients. And it's really showing in early treatment as well as late treatment there. But clearly early treatment is, is in prophylaxis basis there. It's where it's working. And there's a belief that that's what really helped India. You can see ivermectin was part of the protocol in India as soon as we had a massive surge we saw in the late spring there. And a lot of people believe that that huge drop we saw was that because they use ivermectin on a prophylactic basis across the country there. Again, a lot of them in India, as well as in South America, and both countries are going straight down. And so there's a very strong uh, real world evidence, as well as clinical trials that are remecting, taken early or even before you're infected can really be helpful. Uh, there's three repurposed drugs that are being uh, uh, investigated in Israel, uh, and they show maybe 100% of efficacy. Of course, it's a bit early to tell. Uh, one is Araplatip, uh, which is used for treating atherosclerosis. Another one is a cancer drug called flumatinib and another uh, HIV medicine. This is the interesting part. These three drugs do not go after the spike protein. Up to now, we've been really focused on the spike protein and they are targeting two other proteins there. What's called the envelope protein, which is basically enveloping the virus there. And the good news about that envelope protein there is that it doesn't mutate between variants. It has been really stable. And, and it looks like between, if you look at all the variants we've seen, 95% of those variants are identical in that part uh, of the environmental protein there. So, so, so that may be good news, but it's still early. Uh, so I want to uh, really recommend you to stay positive, wear a mask, you know, uh, use common sense if you're in an indoor crowded area there and please get vaccinated. Uh, please, if you haven't seen, look at my first video where I do a really deep dive on what's happening with Delta, the vaccination, and, um, and also the people over the age of 65 uh, protection. Stay healthy and I'll see you in a month.